Welcome to our 2019 Life with Phil talk. Uh, my name is Lynette Marshall, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to welcome you here today on behalf of the University of Iowa Center for Advancement and uh, my dear friend and colleague, Dave Dirks. Thanks for attending this spring's Life with Phil lecture. It's become an annual tradition for us to celebrate philanthropy at the University of Iowa through our Life with Phil activities and to thank our generous alumni and friends who make so much of our work here at the University of Iowa possible. You may have noticed yesterday the tagging on campus to represent the presence of philanthropy here at the university. And while it's easy to recognize Phil or philanthropy in the buildings and the things that go on in the buildings, our donors also make a difference in the many, many ways um, that they offer scholarships, support for our faculty for thoughtful and insightful research, and providing innovative resources for programming across the campus. And we're grateful to the many donors who are here with us today. Today, we're really honored and delighted, honestly, to be able to hear from Dave Dirks. He's a longtime fundraising professional at the University of Iowa and a colleague to so many of us. And it's a special treat to have so many former colleagues with us in the audience today as well. Dave graduated from the University of Iowa with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Journalism and Mass Communications in 1970. And after a brief stint with American Airlines where he uh, learned to love airplanes and airports, he began his career at the University of Iowa Foundation, now the University of Iowa Center for Advancement. So Dave has really dedicated his entire career to supporting his alma mater, the university, and securing philanthropic support from generous alumni and friends. Dave initiated our organization's planned and major giving program in 1973, supervised its management and development until 1999 when he was named Assistant Vice President for Principal Gifts. He served in that capacity until 2005 when he was named Vice President, and he continues to carry out substantial generous gift work at the Center for Advancement. So if you're counting, that's a 46-year career with the university. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. During that time, this is impressive, he has worked with seven university presidents, four interim presidents, and hundreds, perhaps thousands of donors around the world who want to give back to Iowa. He's also been active in several professional councils and has been a presenter at lots and lots of groups, including the National Conference on Planned Giving, the Mid-Iowa Planned Giving Council, the Council for the Advancement and Support of Education, and has contributed articles for various development publications, including Case, Currents, Kiplinger, and the Chronicle of Philanthropy. Dave's work on behalf of his community is equally impressive. He is a founding member of both the Iowa City Public Library Foundation and the Iowa City Community School District Foundation, and currently serves as chair of the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Foundation Board of Trustees. And we're delighted to have friends from that organization with us today. In addition, he has served on the Oak Knoll Retirement Community Board, is a current board member of the Oak Knoll Foundation, and is a past member of the Burr Oak Land Trust, uh, which we used to know as the Johnson County Land Trust, as well as on the Iowa Women's Foundation Board and he currently serves on the board of the Iowa City Free Lunch Program. He serves as an advisor and board member to several area military veteran groups. He served in the United States Army and the Iowa Army National Guard for 28 years, retiring at the rank of Master Sergeant. For his service to his country and community, he was named the Johnson County Soldier of the Year in 1988. Those of us in this room are fortunate to call Dave a colleague and a friend and a mentor. Please join me in welcoming Dave Dirks.
Thank you, Lynette. Um, as she uh, reflects upon, there's an awful lot of folks here that have been a big part of my life through the years. And, you know, it, it, it's kind of like a funeral, but I'm alive. So <laughs> thank you all. So I, I'm breaking Sandy Boyd's rule to never talk more than three minutes. My apologies to Sandy and most of all to the rest of you. I should point out also, incidentally, Sandy Boyd just celebrated his 92nd birthday last Friday. So if you happen to run across him, wish him a happy birthday. So this is the week that we celebrate all things philanthropic. Hence the term Phil's Week and this Life with Phil talk. It's a broad topic. We can spend the better part of the next hour and indeed perhaps the next day discussing philanthropy and how it has changed and shaped our culture and our country. But if you will, allow me to focus on probably just three areas today. First, a bit of a walk down memory lane. Um, what did the philanthropic landscape look like when I arrived in Iowa City in 1973? Then a quick glance at where things kind of stand today in the world of philanthropy, a snapshot, if you will, of where we are right now. And then finally, a peek at a few things that I've learned in this business and perhaps a guess at the future of where charitable giving might be going. So, we rolled into town in January of 1973. We were relatively newlyweds. My wife, Sally, who's with us today, also from the Chicago area, and she attended the University of Illinois. And we stopped up at the corner of Clinton Street and Iowa Avenue, and she looked through the windshield and she said, you know, this is a beautiful little campus town, but where's the downtown? <laughs> you got it, babe, this is it. So in 1973, the university had 19,000 students. Iowa City had a population of 35,000. Coralville, 11,000. North Liberty, 600 people. Lone Tree actually had a tree. <laughs> Pitcher of beer at Joe's was 75% of haircut at Red's was three bucks. There was no CAM bus. There was no wellness center. Uh, there were no online classes. You know, hell, there were no computers. A meeting with a faculty member was just that, a meeting with your professor at his or her office and oftentimes at their home. There was no texting, no email. There was no, there was no Coral Ridge Mall in those days. The closest thing to Marshall Fields was Sears or Pennies. Was it a community dark age? Absolutely not. Perhaps it was a slower, gentler age, but this university was just as exciting and as dynamic as what you see today. Now there were three, three, count them, three 501c3 organizations in Johnson County in 1973. The University of Iowa, the University of Iowa Foundation, and I believe the other was the Mercy Hospital Foundation. I'm not sure, but I think that's what it was. At that time, the University of Iowa Foundation had seven employees. I think there might be two of us here today, myself and Olga Sassine may be here. Uh, Olga was a long time a longtime employee of the foundation, and she was actually the first person that I saw. She was our receptionist in those days when I walked in the office on my first day. So in 1972, the year before I arrived, just one year before, the foundation had raised over $5.5 million. Now, I need to point something out. That was an extraordinary year, but Mr. Roy Carver had made his first gift of $5 million that year, so ultimately, <laughs> We only raised $500,000. <laughs> incidentally, I should point out, I think it was a source of great pride to my, my boss, Daryl Weirich, and to all of us, that that was the largest private gift to any institutional organization that, that year, and that was a real milestone. So at that time, we had three scholarships. We had one professorship, the Gallup Chair in Journalism. Now, that was not an endowment. It was simply an add-on stipend. It was to an existing faculty line. It was $4,000 per year that was added to that faculty line, and it was a gift, an annual gift from the Gallup organization. There were two buildings on campus that were actually constructed uh, partially or totally with private support. Uh, one of those you're sitting in today, not in this room, but in the main lounge. And that's an interesting story that I found out the hard way that back in 1926, 27, when they were raising money for that capital campaign, which incredibly, they were raising money for capital campaigns back, back then too, 
there was a requirement that anyone who graduated in 1926 or 1927 before they got their degree had to make a pledge to the Memorial Union. So as you can imagine, once I was on board working for the foundation, if I ran into anybody from those two classes, it was awful. <laughs> the other, other uh, building that was built with private support was the old Museum of Art, which was flooded in 2008. Uh, that was the other building. So it was within that environment that I happened to stumble along. And allow me, if I can, to give you just a kind of a few minutes of how I actually got my job. And I think surely you're here, you'll get a kick out of this because you know the story. But I was, uh, as Lynette said, working for American Airlines in Chicago. I was in a, a very good program of theirs, their management understudy program. But along about 1972, something happened in this country called the OPEC oil embargo. At that time, 60% of this nation's oil came from the Middle East. And the OPEC nations decided to punish the United States by cutting off the spigot on oil. So immediately, there were long lines for gas, gasoline purchases. There was gas rationing. Um, there was no jet fuel, so jet planes couldn't fly. Uh, ergo, those people that worked for airlines were being laid off right and left, and I was in that, I was in that position. So it was at that point that I began to wonder what I was going to do. And I came out to Iowa City to visit my college roommate, a man by the name of Alan Rossman, who was working for the foundation at the time. Alan was a great guy, and we were uptown one day, and we had a chance meeting with Daryl Weirich, my future boss, right in front of Bremer's on Washington Street. And I kind of, we had a five minute chat and I kind of told Daryl what was going on and Daryl said, you know, I'm kind of thinking maybe I'm gonna add another person to the staff. And if you're interested, why don't you apply? So I did apply. And the position was for a planned or deferred giving position. That is, this new person would be working with elderly people primarily, working on their estate gifts. So I interviewed, the board met me, and then the board had to decide whether to hire me or not, and they were divided because several of the board members felt that I was too young, not a good connection, couldn't relate to older people, it would be a difficult time, and I wouldn't be successful. Others felt the same way, and this went on for several months. So finally, they had one last board meeting toward the end of 1972, and they actually held it in, at O'Hare Airport at the Seven Continents restaurant, and. Uh, uh, they asked me again to come up and talk to the board, which I did, give them my five-minute spiel, and I left. Same argument again. He's too young, doesn't relate, won't connect. The other side of the room said he'd be perfect. It was going back and forth and back and forth. Well, Roy Carver, who is not a patient man, was sitting next to Daryl. And in the middle of this conversation, he reached over, picked up his checkbook, wrote a check for $50,000, which would be the, the two-year payment for salary and benefits for this new person, slid it to Daryl and said, I'm tired of this discussion, I'm hungry, let's go to lunch, hire the kid. <laughs> so I actually got this job because of Roy Carver's appetite. <laughs> so from those humble beginnings, where do we stand today? Uh, it's a lot different. Last year, the University of Iowa Center for Advancement recorded the following very, very impressive totals. Nearly $213 million raised this past year. That's nearly a 4,000% increase from those 1972 figures. We have 1,615, the number of student scholarships that provide annually over $13 million in student financial aid to this institution. That's probably the one point I'm most proud about. The total endowment for those scholarships is $329 million. We have 229 funds that represent endowed chairs or professorships. That's another $319 million in endowed funds. Total endowed funds at the University of Iowa Center for Advancement this past year topped $1.1 billion. That's billion with a B. Thank you. So the University of Iowa Foundation and the Center for Advancement has been responsible for building entirely or through partial support of capital campaigns for over 70 buildings or capital projects on this campus. Old Capitol, Carver Hawkeye Arena, the Hardin Medical Library, the Beckwith Both House, former Museum of Art, Cardiovascular Center, the Stead Family Children's Hospital, Kinnick Stadium, Hanch Auditorium, Iowa Hall Museum of Natural History, Papa John Business Building, 
Pomerantz Center, the Voxman Building, the Adler Building, the Schaefer Library and the Writer's Workshop, and the current home of the University of Iowa Center for Advancement, the Levitt Center. These and many, many more projects were all made possible through the years of the efforts of the University of Iowa Foundation in years past, and in current years, the University of Iowa Center for Advancement. Now, as Lynette pointed out, not all of them, or all of them were tagged earlier this week. They were tagged yesterday, and I'm sorry they're still not up. They had black and gold ribbons on them, and whenever we do this every year, I hope that you'll, you'll take part of that day to kind of wander through campus to see the impact that private philanthropy has had upon, physically had, upon this campus. So no question, but private support has been an immense fiscal partner in shaping this institution. Now multiply what has happened here in Iowa City over the last 45 years with what has transpired nationwide. Let's take a view of today's philanthropy from 35,000 feet, if you will, the, the type of charitable environment that we live in, not only here in Iowa City, but throughout this country. Now the figures I'm going to give you are 2016 figures. They're from Giving USA and the Bureau of Statistics. I think the 2017 statistics will be out shortly, any day now. In fact, they might even be out already, I'm not sure. But total giving to all charities in 2016 was $390 billion. That represents a stunning 2% of this nation's GDP. 71% of those came from individuals. Private foundations provided 15%. Bequests and estate gifts at 9% and corporate giving at 5%. We give the, the most as a nation, twice what the next country, Canada, gives and two-thirds more than our British neighbors. When it comes to supporting overseas aid and natural disaster, citizens of the United States give 10 times more than the next philanthropic country, the United Kingdom. So, in our country, what do you think is the most generous state in the Union? Any, any guesses? I can't, I can't see you real well, but holler out, a, holler out a state if you think you know what the state's the most generous state is. Iowa. Iowa. Great guess. You're wrong. <laughs> any, any more? Utah. Utah. Who said that? You're right. It is Utah. You read my speech. It's true. Utah is the, is the most philanthropic state in the Union. And, and why? We probably all know why. There's a great Mormon influence, Church of the Latter-day Saints, tremendous amount of support for that organization. So, all right, that was an easy one. Give me the least generous state in the Union. California. Wrong. Not Hawaii. You'll never get it. It's New Hampshire. God, I have no idea why it's New Hampshire, but it's New Hampshire. <laughs> Iowa by, um, is right in the middle, by the way. We're right in the middle at number 24, and it, it seems to me that Iowa always seems to be in the middle. <laughs> you know, we, we always think of ourselves as, you know, we're not, we're not excellent. We're, we're always pretty good. We're just pretty good. You know, Dean Fethke used to say, you know, if Iowa were located next to Lake Superior, it'd be called Lake Pretty Good. So let's, uh, let's talk about cities. This is an easy one. What's the most generous city in the United States? Go on. Utah is the most generous state. Very good. Salt Lake City. Exactly. What's the least generous city in the United States? And I have, again, what was it? Concord, New Hampshire. You're close. You're close. Hartford, Connecticut. And I, again, I, I hope you don't have any relatives in Hartford, Connecticut. I <laughs> feel badly for you if you do. Um, Dallas and Austin are, are two kind of intriguing cities for me. Though they're only 180 miles apart, they're two of the largest cities in Texas and, and indeed the United States, and they share the same economic climate, the exact same levels of state taxation, same basic cost of living, but where they differ is in their culture. Dallasites, I don't know, can, he, can we call them Dallasites? What do you call people from Dallas? Dallasites, I guess gave almost 40% more to charitable causes than uh, what we call Austinites. Well, why? Uh, the critics would, and conservative pundits would be very quick to point out that Austin is a university city with a very large liberal base. Does that sound familiar? So the assumption is that liberals must not be charitable, right? Well, they're wrong. What the example points out is simply the powerful influence of charitable behavior that is exerted by factors like religious practice 
and, and maybe to a lesser degree, political ideology. So let's look at that political ideology. Who are the more generous, Democrats or Republicans? It's an interesting question in this current political environment. And as you would well guess, the answer is pretty complicated. Republicans are far more generous when it comes to individual giving, 31% giving $1,000 or more annually versus 17% by Democrats, 20% among independents. So what about conservatives versus liberals? Who's more generous? When it comes to individual giving, conservatives by a healthy margin. Conservative households, by and large, have 6% less income than their liberal peers, yet support char charitable organizations by a figure of 10% more than identified liberals. Now, once again, that large conservative figure reflects an emphasis and the influence of their support upon religious organizations. Now, when it comes to private foundations, the reverse is true. Liberal and Democratic-leading foundations are far more generous than so-called conservative foundations. 82 conservative organizations who gave at least 100 million in 2016 versus 122 liberal foundations who gave at that same level. The results are somewhat ambiguous in that the 122 liberal foundations, they have far more assets than the 82 foundations that identify them as conservatives. So let's look at those private foundations. Now, those numbers have really soared in the last generation. Most, most Americans feel that private philanthropy, private foundations play a very important role in philanthropy. Other than that, most people don't know a whole lot about private foundations. Only one in 10 and four out of 10 community leaders can name a private foundation located within their community or their region. Think about it, could you, in Iowa City, Johnson County? Community Foundation of Johnson County is one that comes to my mind, but private foundations, you don't feel bad. I don't think there are any in Iowa City at that level. And the Hall Perrine Foundation in Cedar Rapids would probably come the closest, but the impact of private foundations is indeed stunning. Private foundations account for almost $70 billion in giving each year. Now, their giving is very focused, and yet it's been noted the charities tend to spend an inordinate amount of time trying to sway support from foundations that have no, no connection to their purpose or their charity. In other words, as fundraisers, we all think that private foundations are kind of the low-hanging fruit that needs to be constantly cultivated. In reality, it is the individual donor who should be the focus of most charitable organizations. Personal gifts account for four times as much support as that which comes from the private foundation biggies like Ford, Gates, Walton, and the others. One more interesting point about private foundations, and then we'll move on. Uh, there is evidence that there's a growing number of new private foundations that are being established, and, and with the intent to spend themselves out of existence within one generation. What's up with that? They have a sunset clause. Translated, that means that many private foundations don't trust next generation management or they feel that they can make a much larger impact upon society by gifting all of their assets away in a relatively short time. This concept is new and produces a unique way of giving. T. Denny Sanford, who is the credit card mogul, lives just one state away in South Dakota. He has a private foundation of $3 billion and he has publicly stated that he plans to bring that figure to net zero by the time he dies. He's in his early 80s, so he better get going. <laughs> so let's go back to that 35,000 feet look at charitable giving, the view of charitable giving. Where does all of that money go? Where does all that $390, million, $390 billion in, in 2016, where did it all go? Religion took 39%. We talked a little bit about that. Education, 19%. Yes. Human services, 15%, health, 15%, overseas aid, 7%, the arts, 6%, nature and environment, 4%. It's interesting to note that with religious giving, and I don't mean to bash religious giving, but it's a big part of philanthropy in this country, persons are seven times more likely to support a religious cause if they attend religious services 27 to 52 times per year. So, all of this support, how many charities does it go to? Does anyone have any idea how many charities, how, how many 501c3s are in this country today? Any idea? Over a million. 
That number has doubled in the last 20 years. But more important, 10% of our U.S. workforce is now involved in some part of the nonprofit sector. I'll say that again. 10% of the U.S. Workforce, workforce is now involved in the nonprofit sector. And that doesn't even include volunteers. Estimates place that at another 400,000 people that work, for volunteer or work as volunteers in charitable organizations but are unpaid. So not everyone can give financial resources. We're also a nation of volunteers. 63 million individual volunteers in the United States in 2016. 25% of all adults volunteer. They average 139 hours per year per volunteer. The value, the value of those volunteer hours is roughly $179 billion. And all volunteers, and if you're a fundraiser, this is an important note, all volunteers are 11 times more likely to contribute money to a charity as those who do not volunteer. So I'd say your best prospects when you're trying to raise money are those people that are out volunteering or are with you on volunteer groups. So who volunteers the most? 29% of females, 23% of males. Married couples outperform singles, 32 to 20%. What age demographic is the most generous? Any guesses? 45 to 54, 30% of that group volunteer. The 65 and olders, like me, that have all that time on their hands, 24% uh, volunteer. And, and while we're at it, let's stop picking on millennials. They volunteer 22%. So don't bash them too hard. So philanthropy, as we now know, is a major resource-producing business in this country. While it is technically a nonprofit, it still has to pay its bills, keep the lights on, and at our place, provide donuts on Fridays. So almost three quarters of all nonprofits now charge service fees on each of their gifts, and that's anywhere from a, a fraction of a penny up to 80 cents on the dollar. Undesignated private contributions help with about 15% of the overhead. Uh, income from endowments account for another 7%. Government grants assist with another 8%, but that includes government paybacks and subsidies from Medicare, Medicaid, and other reimbursable programs. Government will certainly not pay for a charitable organization's administrative fees, I can tell you that. So we'll circle back from that 35,000 feet a little bit closer to home, and now we're talking statistics again and how things have changed. So in this day and age, quick snapshot, how many charitable organizations are in the state of Iowa? How many 501c3s are registered in the state of Iowa? Any guesses? 15,000. 15,000. Remember when I said that when I arrived in Iowa City in 1973, there were how many in, in Johnson County? Three. Okay, you're going to guess how many there are now. Any, any guesses? Come on. And this time I want you to guess. 750. Wrong. <laughs> higher. 900. Higher. You're close. 1,276. There are 1,276 501c3 is just in Johnson County. The largest 501c3 is the Viridian Credit Union. Remember, credit unions are nonprofit, technically nonprofit. So the largest 501c3 in Iowa is the Viridian Credit Union up in Waterloo. Uh, next is Grinnell College. The University of Iowa Center for Advancement is the fifth largest 501c3 in the state. Iowa State, if you're keeping notes, is seventh on that list. Um, <laughs> Largest county with charitable assets is Polk. Johnson County comes in fourth place. So if it's such a career, what about salaries within that career track? Are paychecks keeping up? Entering salaries for a new employee with some fundraising experience these days is approximately $50,000. Now when I arrived, fundraising was not considered a high salary career. Daryl told me when I was hired, he said, you know, you're not gonna make much but you, still, you sure will sleep better at night. And he really was right. So it, within this environment, let's switch to kind of the last thing, and let's talk a little bit about where is charitable giving going. Years ago, I, I pulled together a listing of my, my top 10 requirements for being a good fundraiser. And I'm not, I'm not gonna bore you with all of them, but I'm gonna give you a, a couple. First and foremost, um, it's all about the donor never about you, the fundraiser. 
And I learned this lesson very early in my career at a board meeting. First year I was with the foundation, I met a, young, a man, I met a gentleman uh, by the name of Bill Powers, who was vice president for Eli Lilly Company out of Indianapolis, Indiana. Lovely man. We had a very good time chatting. And after the board meeting, I sent him a letter. And I just sent the letter saying how much I enjoyed getting to know him. And about a week later, later he returned that same letter. And in that, he had circled every time I'd referred to I or me. At the bottom of the letter, he wrote a note that said, always remember, it's never about you, it's always about the donor. So what Bill was trying to say, I guess, that day was no matter what is going on in your life, no matter how bad your day has been or that somebody has cut you off in traffic or you got a dentist appointment, when, when you meet with that donor, nothing is more important to him or her. Place all of your attentions and efforts on them and you will never, ever go wrong. So another thought, patience is not a virtue, in fundraising it's required. And that reminds me of another story of Lloyd and Betty Shermer. Lloyd and Betty, uh, Betty was the daughter of Phil and Henrietta Adler, and Phil Adler was the uh, publisher of the Quad Cities Times Democrat, was also the president and CEO of Lee Enterprises, uh, daily Iowan editor when he was here in the 20s, and he was on our board when I first started, and he was a great man, lovely man, both he and Henrietta. And they had passed away, and I always felt that their daughter and son-in-law, and Lloyd had kind of married into the business too because he became president and CEO of Lee Enterprises. So they had both done well, and I kept thinking there was going to be something that would resonate with them where they would want to have the Adler name on it. And over the years, I would send them a note and say, how about a scholarship bearing their name, professorship, a chair, a lectureship? None of those things seemed to resonate. Well. The School of Journalism in those days was located on South Madison Street in the Communications Center, and, and that building is and is today a dump. It was a dump the day it opened. And so there was talk about renovating it, and smart people began to realize that this was not worth it, that maybe we ought to be thinking about a new building. So there was discussion about building a brand new building that would house the School of Journalism, the Daily Iowan, and some other, other units. And, it was in the, and I cut that article out of the Daily Iowan, and I sent it to, to Lloyd and Betty. And I said, wouldn't it be great if we built a new building and the Adler name was on it? And about a week later, I got a note back from Lloyd, and he said, two words on it, let's talk. And ultimately, that let's talk led to the $3 million leadership gift that provided us with the Adler building just across the field from here. So, so one of the biggest mistakes, and again, this is, this is my opinion here, but I, I think one of the biggest mistakes we, we tend to make in development work today is, is being impatient. Thinking that we know what the donor wants and then pushing that individual into making an early gift commitment. You know, that gift may be very nice, but had the fundraiser taken the time and the patience, oftentimes there is a much larger gift out there, and indeed, what I would term a passion gift. With time, patience, and listening, I'm convinced good things always happen. So another thought. You need to teach yourself the art of empathic listening. It's the art of being a good listener. Putting yourself in the donor's shoes, understanding them totally and completely. You know, in school they teach us to read and write, but how many people have gone to a course where they taught you how to listen? We don't have those. So piggybacking on what I just said with patience, listening goes hand in hand. Donors give us clues in our conversations with them. And a good fundraiser, if they're a good listener, an empathic listener, will hear them and build their proposal accordingly based upon those clues. One of those was, was Dorothy Sherman. Dorothy was a speech pathologist and audiologist here in Iowa City. And when I knew her, I think she had just retired. And a lovely lady who had set up a scholarship fund in that discipline and she always told me that, you know, I've got three passions in life, just three passions in life, and that's reading, gardening, and cooking. Those are the things I really, really love. I always remember that. So later in life, uh, Dorothy was, was struggling a bit medically, and she had really no relatives close by, but she did have some relatives that were distant relatives up in the Twin Cities, and we convinced her that she should kind of reconnect, and she did. So subsequently, she changed her will toward the end and left all of her personal effects to the family, which was fine with us. So within about a week or two of her passing, that family came down with their giant U-Haul and they, they cleaned, it, cleaned the house out. They took everything. 
everything from the broken down picnic table in the backyard to the half a bag of dog food that Dorothy was using to feed the raccoons. Everything was gone. <laughs> everything but one thing. Anyone guess what that might be? Books. A whole wall of books. They didn't touch. So a couple weeks after they had signed off, the family had signed off, I was co-executor with Iowa State Bank and we were at the house. There wasn't much there and we were kind of finishing up a few things and I walked over to the, sh the bookcase and I took a book out and I started plumbing through it and out dropped a hundred dollar bill. Went through a few more pages, out dropped a 50 and then a 20 and then another hundred. Well, you know how the story goes. At the end of the day, after we'd gone through all those books, it was $14,000 in cash that we had found that the family in Minneapolis never found out about. We never told them. <laughs> Never told me. We added all that to, to her scholarship fund, and it was great. And so the point I'm trying to make is that if you listen carefully, if you listen carefully, good things do happen. There are clues out there, and probably what we should have done is gone back and dug up Dorothy's garden. So. <laughs> now, finally, in this ever-expanding business of fundraising that's changed so much through the years, always remember, that as a fundraiser, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of pointing to all of you that are in fundraising or related to fundraising, that as fundraisers we maintain one of the most important and honorable roles in society. You know, Winston Churchill said it best, we make a living by what we get, we make a life by what we give. We assist donors to help find their legacy. We help connect them to their meaning in life. I get it, career and family mean a great deal to all of us, that's for sure. But to each of us, there is something more out there. Something that allows us to say that in the twilight years of our life that we have made a difference. That we have touched other lives. That our life did indeed have meaning. Charitable giving is one of the few ways that can be accomplished. And as one of my colleagues is fond of saying, as fundraisers, we consider ourselves dream weavers to many. We help people fulfill their dreams and their legacy that will ultimately help to define their lives. Think about that. There are not many professions that provide you with that privilege or that honor. Let me finish up a little story that serves as a reflection of what I just said. And I, again, I apologize. It's the Esco Oberman story. And God, you've all heard this before, but I got to tell it again. I will. As we all, we, a lot of us in this room know Esco very well. He was the true Renaissance man, a successful educational PhD, spent most of his work in government. He's the kind of guy that made his own wine. He could sing Danny Boy on his birthday. And I remember one day we went to a football game together. He's so modest and humble. We were walking to Kinnick Stadium and he tripped and fell on the curb right in front of Stella's, which was Stella's at the time. I don't know what it was. And didn't say much, dusted himself off. We went and sat through the game, enjoyed the game. Got him back home. The next day I called and said, how you doing? He said, fine, just back to the hospital. And I said, the hospital, what happened? He said, well, when I fell, I broke my arm. And I said, you broke your arm? And he said, oh yeah, I knew it right away. But he said, I didn't want to bother anyone. That was, that was Esco. One of the things that... Um, that he never told me until probably toward the latter part of his life, and I think Dave Triplett, same thing, he didn't tell us until well into his later years, was that um, after, second, after the Second World War, he was called to Washington by Secretary of, of War Marshall and asked to put together a committee that would try and figure out what we can do to get the GIs back into the mainstream of the workforce and the education pro educational process. And, and basically they were asked to think about what to do with those soldiers that came back that had special needs and handicaps. And this committee met for about six or seven weeks and they went back to Secretary of War Marshall and said, you know what, uh, we like that idea but we think we ought to offer it to all returning soldiers from World War II. And so that piece of legislation was written and we all know that today as the GI Bill. And to talk about how humble and modest he was, he never talked about that until the last couple of years of his life. So in those last years of his life, in the last few days of his life, Esco was dying, he was dying of cancer, and he was lo located over at University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics, and we got him a room in oncology which kind of looked out onto the field house, which is where he had spent so many, many happy hours when he was on the gymnastics team. And a lot of us, a lot of you in this room tonight, 
walked over to the hospital to see Esco on a regular basis. And, and I was there one day, and we were talking, and he was, some, day, some days he was very chatty, some days he was very re reserved, and today he was chatty. And we started talking about his life as a child and on the farm in Pleasant View, Iowa. And I said, so Esco, did you have a job when you were working there when you were a youngster? And he said, yeah, I did. He said, I was 10 years old, was my first job. And he said, I would take water out to the farm laborers out in the fields. I'd have a couple of buckets, and I'd fill them up with water, take them out to the farm laborers, I'd take their empty buckets, take them back, fill them up, do the whole process day in and day out. I said, wow, that was kind of hard work, wasn't it, Esco? And he said, yes, it was. And I said, kind of sarcastically, and I shouldn't have, but I did. And I said, so Esco, I said, they pay you for that? He said, definitely, oh yeah, they did. And I said, so how much did you make? And he said, I made a quarter a day. I said, geez, that's a lot of money, Esco. I said, what did you do with it all? And he suddenly got very quiet, and then he got himself up, leaned onto his right elbow, I remember this, I can, like it's yesterday, looks me right in the eye and said, I gave it to you. So, to my fundraising co colleagues, let's never forget that lesson that Esco gave us. It wasn't a lesson, it was more of a gift that he gave me and I think all of us. What you do is honorable, and what you do is extraordinary. It is a privilege like no other, fundraising. So those are just a few nuggets of advice that I have stumbled upon through my 45 years at the U of I Foundation and now the UI Center for Advancement. Where the next 45 years will go, that's anyone's guess. But here's, here's my hope. I hope that at the end of the next 45 years, there might be someone in this room today who will pick up with this conversation where I just left off. Thanks so much.